Today, we are continuing in our series in 2 Corinthians. Uh, it could be a running joke because we've just been going at it so long, but here we are. And so uh, there's no, uh, well, there is an end in sight, but um, we're not there yet. Uh, but we are, uh, today we're covering the end of the section on generosity. And so I want to do a little bit of review over the last couple of weeks because we've been covering a lot about generosity and there's a lot to be said about it in our world today as well as among churches. And so it, it just helps to kind of have some unity in what we are talking about. So you can go to the next slide there. So our first week we talked about the grace of giving and we learned that generosity flows from our joy that comes from salvation. I don't want to give too much away because a lot of what we're going to be talking about today uh, is involved with that dynamic. And really the section we're covering today is a great summary chunk to help summarize this thing on generosity. But really that action of being generous, doing generosity, it flows from the fact that we are people who have been saved by grace through faith uh, it's not on our own that we, we do this, although we could probably have some empathy and, you know, some good feelings towards people. But really, when we as believers share of our, our supply, that's what we do. And so that brings us to uh, the second week we learned what it looks like to share in community and how generosity trusts God to supply the needs of his people both supernaturally, we believe for that, but also practically through the fact that he blesses you to be a blessing, and he blesses me to be a blessing to others. And that can take all kinds of shapes and forms. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The third week, as kind of, kind of a cornerstone of this topic of generosity is we looked at gospel generosity, how actually being generous is something that points us back to the gospel. And we learned about that because Paul mentioned in his letter to the church that he was sending the brother who was chosen because of his exuberance for the gospel, his eagerness to spread the gospel. And so that week we learned that generosity seeks to honor God with our compassion as God has shown us great love and mercy, we show that to others. And so last week, we also learned about how all of this looks practically of living generously or living a generous life. Generosity reinforces our commitment to help, that when we hear about someone in need, whether it's a brother and sister in Christ or maybe somebody out in the community who does not yet know Christ, when we're moved to compassion and, and towards that person, that the act of generosity, it is that reinforcement of what we're saying. We're not just a lot of lip service. We're actually doing the things that we say we're going to do. And Paul wanted to remind the Corinthian believers in the, in the city of Corinth, in the region of Achaia, he wanted to remind them that, hey, guys, you said you were going to help the church in Jerusalem I need you to make good on that promise. And so that's been the summary point of where we're going, and that leads us all to today. You can go to the next slide, and the title for today's message is Giving and Thriving. Giving and Thriving. Our passage is going to be the rest of chapter 9, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. And our big idea that we're going to be exploring together is that generosity lives out our confession of the gospel of Christ. Generosity lives out our confession of the gospel of Christ. And you can go to the next slide. When thinking about generosity and giving and thriving, um, it, I like trees. <laughs> and so I, I love uh, the, the image this is an image I found probably about eight or nine years ago, and then I, every time I want to use it again, uh, I need to hunt through the internet to find this exact one because I think it's just so good. 
because you got the hands that are all dirty and grimy from having the soil on there, and then you got the tree and everything. What this reminds me of is how for us as believers, as people who follow Jesus, we are about bringing life to dead places, places that need God and his kingdom, for God to breathe new life into a person, into a community, into a region, and ultimately the world. And that through the way we live our lives, through the way that we interact with other people, that isn't always a clean endeavor. Uh, Sometimes we get a little messy in the process, because guess what? People are messy myself included. (laughs) Uh, But all kidding aside, just some people, their lives are not in order. Sometimes there's, even for those of us who follow Jesus, sometimes our lives are not in order, and we're we're still continuing on that, that path of sanctification and growing in our faith and in our walk with Jesus. But sometimes we need others to come alongside us and to help advocate for life. And so this idea of giving and thriving, I don't want to give too much away because we're going to have a lot of imagery in our passage and we're going to have a lot to talk about today. But I wanted to to just get this image because ultimately in Scripture, you and I are called to both receive the life that God has for us and also to share it with others. And that can look a lot like, metaphorically speaking, somebody with this beautiful little sapling that looks like it's fully grown and the image is probably photoshopped, but somebody with their hands around this cup of dirt trying to plant something somewhere that needs life. And so I think that might be a good bridge to the idea of what Paul is suggesting in this section in his letter on generosity, that although uh, the, the action of being generous is to fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus in a completely different part of the world, and it's really a collection of monies, uh, not uh, bartered goods or anything like that, but actually collecting funds so that they could take it back. And Paul was being trusted with this large sum of money to go help the church in Judea. The act of generosity, even though it it seems so simple and seems so transactional, is actually more of an investment into the life of the church as a family. Um, Not that Corinth or Judea are any better or worse than each other, but we're all one in Christ. Just like here in town, no one church in Christ is any better or worse than another. Now, we all might have some things to grow in. However, you know, the church down the street, we bless them and we love them, and we want to champion the work that God is doing in Christ rooted in scripture in them. We want to champion that. That's one of the reasons we partner with a church like Crossroad and with Florence Christian at times also, because they're right down the street from us. So anyway, enough on my soapbox about that. In this transition to reading the scripture, I would challenge you to think about the relationship as we're reading through the relationship that Paul is bringing up between the act of giving and the reality of thriving. Okay? So, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll begin in verse 6. Okay, you can go to the next slide. All right. Paul, speaking to the church, says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows sparingly 
generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through the us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you have proved yourselves. Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers... For you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his incredible gift. Friends, this is the word of the Lord written by the Apostle Paul. And I want to highlight before we move on, you can go a couple slides deep. Next, next, next. And there we go. So Paul, he introduces us to this image. It's not a new one if you're, new, if, if you're acquainted with the Bible. Uh, in those times, people were much more connected to their resource of farming. And so the idea of sowing and reaping, or what we would say of planting and harvesting, that was a very common image for people in Paul's day where they, would, they had this understanding that, you, that a farmer would go out to scatter seed and that in hopes that through all the, the elements and all the everything working together and by God's grace, that crop would grow and they'd be able to harvest it and then be able to go to market and sell it. And so uh, much of the mindset of flourishing or thriving was directly connected to the land and what, what could be produced from a crop. Uh, that's also why in many of ancient cultures, you had a lot of uh, different cult religions that had different fertility practices and things in order to try and uh, curry the favor of the gods, so to speak, in order to produce some kind of a crop. Now, for the people Paul was talking to, these are followers of Jesus. It's not just some Greek god or goddess that is associated with that. And I'm sure my daughter Maggie is like, ah, I know who, it, who that would be, because she's studying all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's not talking about those people. It's talking about the God of the Bible who ultimately pours out his grace through sending the sun and the rain on the crops of both the godly and the ungodly. And so for Paul, he's bringing up this image, and I don't want to go too deep into the image because I think I don't want to belabor the point, and we're going to get there in just a moment. But all of this directly links to this dynamic of what is given and then what is produced. In my opinion, there has been an abuse within the church, not our church, but the church at large, where 
many times through the use of television and televangelists, many times in an effort for fundraising, people will highlight this principle and say, if you give this much, you will receive this much. Now, for me, I don't buy it. I never have, hope to never will. And the reason why is because just because I give money doesn't necessitate the fact that God's going to give me money. Our God is not a transactional God in the sense of he's not wanting me to put this in like a slot machine and get out the jackpot. Okay, so let's just, disclosure, that's not where I'm going with this. However, that being said, there seems to be a dynamic at work in what Paul is telling the Corinthians of a principle of sowing or planting, whichever word you want to choose to use, and what you reap. And it's not necessarily a tit-for-tat kind of dynamic between that. But it is, I'm giving this, and I'm expecting God to work somehow through that gift. And that is ultimately going to be for the thriving and flourishing of his people, myself included, as well as the, the, the kingdom at large. So, we could just all go home with that, but I think we could, uh, there's some things that come up in our passage that are worth highlighting. You can go to the next slide. So, giving and thriving, I believe, comes from hearts that know God's love. So, already covered, there's this principle of sowing and reaping. Paul, he's highlighting in the passage as a whole, he's highlighting quality over quantity, okay? But in 6 and 7, in those verses, he uses this beautiful, confounding imagery that if it's not about quantity, what's going on there? Where he says, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. What is going on there? And then, not only that, but then he goes on to say that God loves a cheerful giver. What is Paul doing? Well, let's explore that. So the idea of sparingly, think about it for your own self. If you were to give sparingly, whatever the item, gift X, if you will, like that variable, if you were to give that thing, what would be the heart behind sowing sparingly? There'd be some kind of restraint in some way. Now, maybe like uh, the widow who only had just the widow's mite or a penny or whatever value you want to associate with that tiny little bit, all that she had left, maybe that's her last currency that she has to her name or your name. And so maybe, oh, it's really hard to not just pinch that penny as I'm, I'm dropping it in the gift box there. Or maybe there is, on, on the flip side, there's, uh, think of, uh, you know, we're coming up to Christmas time and Ebenezer Scrooge and, and, you know, the miserly kind of person where they have a lot. They have so much. But they're wanting to be miserly about it of like, you want me to give this little bit? Are you insane? <laughs> so to sow sparingly or to give sparingly might indicate maybe some kind of restraint, but it also might indicate a heart place where there's a reluctance of some, for some reason, they don't want to 
give of that gift. On the flip side, for generous, giving generously, it's maybe, think of people who are generous, maybe they have been blessed with some great abundant sum and they just want to give it all away. Usually there's some planning involved, there's some preparation involved in order to give such a liberal, in the purest sense of the word, not political, but purest, like abundant, extravagant, out of this world gift, like, are you crazy? How could you give that much? But yet to be generous really means to have that heart that says, I'm going to go all in on this gift. And there's intention behind it. Now, within those two verses, there's also the part where Paul is, he explains that bit of reluctance and how you should give what you've decided to give as a cheerful giver because God loves a cheerful giver. I love that word love. We talked about it in youth group uh, on Tuesday. Um, the word for love, it's actually the Greek word for unconditional love. And so if love is a verb, it's an action word, and God is doing that action of loving the cheerful giver, that begs the question, I know you were asking it, is it that he loves the cheerful giver because of their gifts, or do they, he, does he just love the cheerful giver, the, the giver themselves? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I, I asked when I was looking through this, and I would submit to you that it, we can't assume, we ought not to assume that God loves the cheerful giver because of the gift. Here's why. Because in order for unconditional love to be the action, that means there cannot be any condition put on that action. It's just something that God does because God is God and he loves us with that unconditional sacrificial love. So it can't be that because if I, if me giving the gift is in any way the condition, then that means it's not unconditional. Now, absolutely, as some of you were amening, yes, absolutely, God loves the cheerful giver just because they are themselves, because they are a person made in God's image that he loves. Amen. Now, so together, to this, putting these two ideas together, maybe God loving a cheerful giver is more about that person reflecting God's cheerful gift of grace because God was glad to give his one and only son, Jesus, for you and for me so that we might be able to receive his love. And so then that act of giving, as simple as it is, and I'm, I don't want to, to say anything that the scripture is not saying, as simple as it is, as like, just to unpack what Paul is saying, he's being just so straightforward with the people. Really, that act of generosity is something that reflects a knowledge that they have experienced. And so, if somebody has made a decision in their mind, whether it's a lot or a little, the quantity at this point technically doesn't matter, even though he's, he highlights the, the dynamic and the principle of sowing and reaping. However, the point is that these people, whatever amount they have decided to give in their heart, God wants them to be cheerful about it because ultimately that gift is pointing back to him. And so that makes me wonder for you and for me, have we experienced God's love? Do we know 
God's love. If we don't, it's here for you to experience today. Let me tell you that God's love is not concerned about how good you are or how right you are or how clean you are or how messy you are or any of it. It's just the fact that God in his grace and his compassion and his graciousness, just because of who God is, he loves you and he loves me. Even when I'm acting a fool, even when I'm, I'm failing time and time again and I fail, or when I succeed, that's not the point. The point is God loves us. And that love is meant to transform us in some way because that is good news, that God loves us. And that's ultimately for us as a community, that's what we confess, that's what we say. We say that our God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to die in our place so that we could experience the fullness of life in Christ. And so from our acts of generosity, that is us living out what we say about Jesus. That brings me to my second thought from this passage. You can go to the next slide. Giving and thriving trust God by freely sharing what God has given. So if you were to kind of separate out the two dynamics there of both giving and thriving, both of those things, those realities, it ultimately trusts God by freely sharing what God has given. Where do I get that? Well, let's talk. So the purpose of God's provision in verse 8, I believe, he talks about it here. So God is able to bless you abundantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. There is a purpose behind the fact that God blesses you abundantly. It's not just so that your needs are taken care of, although that's a good thing. It's not just so that I can have this big lump sum in my retirement someday where I can just rest and be cushy and like just rest on my laurels. God has blessed me and you in order to be a blessing and so that we would excel in every good work. And that abundant blessing, it provides our needs and it gives us something for us to give away as well. It's an overflow. It's an abundance from the Lord. Even if, shocker, if you personally believe yourself as poor, like I have lived before, and in some ways I still live poor. Those three kids of mine, they eat me out of house and home, and all those things. Even so, God has blessed us, whether we think we're poor or we think we're rich, God has given us something to give. Now, oftentimes, preachers, over the years, we've kind of whittled it down to a top three category of how you kind of, there's probably more categories, but it makes for nice preaching. <laughs> and so God has given each and every one of us at least three things. Are you ready? He's given us our time. He's given us our talent. He's given us treasure, means to, like some kind of monetary means in order to use both for our sustenance as well as for to be a blessing. And so thinking about if we're going to trust God to, be, to supply all of our needs and to supply some so that we can give it to other people, how can we give our time? How has God given you time 
as a gift, both for your betterment as well as for a way to bless other people? Has God given you some kind of a talent, some special skill? Any bass players in the room, we need you on the worship team. Hallelujah, I'm believing for it. Because let me tell you, as a drummer, I need my bass player, and I don't got one. Uh, so that's why I put the bass there. I love it. So anyway, it doesn't have to be music. God has given each and every one of you some kind of good gift of skill and talent that you can contribute to the family in some way that you can use in order to be a blessing in our community. Has he given you funds, like some kind of money, where you can be, you can share that generously? Even with many of us and our mindsets and everything of, of, uh, of money that is given to us and that we have because of the jobs that God has given us, because of whatever transactions get made. Um, I love the, the focus of, there's a program called Financial Peace University, and I love that one of the steps in Financial Peace University is to be a giver. I don't know the exact actual step. Angie's the one who went through it. But um, I know that one of the ultimate goals of Financial Peace University as a process is to be generous with what God has given you. Has he given you money so that you can share either with the body of Christ or be able to be a blessing to one of the, the other helps ministries in our community like food share, like I don't know, if we were to start up some kind of a soup kitchen here or something, I don't know. But my point is, has he given you that? God has given you something. And I believe firmly that if every single one of us gave something, the church wouldn't want for much. Whether that's volunteering your time, whether that's giving your skill through volunteering your time and your skill, whether that's giving money, whatever, whether that's even just giving a smile to somebody who really needs to have, you know, they're looking down in the dumps and they just need somebody to sit with them and be a kind, non-anxious presence like Jesus. God has given us something. Will we give it? Will we use it for his glory? Because ultimately that that act of giving those things and not just hoarding them for ourselves is how we live out our, what we say, our confession of the good news about Jesus Christ. Third and final thing of our passage today, you can go to the final slide there, is that giving and thriving lead to more people experiencing God's goodness. Giving and thriving, it leads to more people experiencing God's goodness. So uh, in verse 12, Paul points out that God's going to supply everybody's need um, through the Lord's people, and that's going to lead to thanksgiving. Uh, you can go to the next slide there. Yep, thank you. Um, and so then what's fascinating to me is that through what Paul says is their act of obedience, which really is ultimately what he's been getting at in the last couple of weeks, is that just follow through on what you say you're going to do. What God has laid on your heart, go do that thing. <clears throat> you know, making sure it's in line with Scripture, making sure that it's consistent with, uh, you know, good godly testimony. Go do that thing that God has said, go be generous in this way to these people. And so what's fascinating in, as he's rounding out this section is that the obedience of the Corinthians ultimately was going to lead to other believers giving thanks to God. Worship, their obedience wasn't just going to be to do the action, but it would actually produce worship, more glory for God. 
And so generosity, it not only just supplies the needs of God's people, it also it produces worship. Now, this makes me wonder. We've, we've done a bunch of, covered a bunch of images and things and ideas about giving over this, the past few weeks. This makes me think of our town of Florence. We have roughly uh, 9,500, 9,600, depending on and above, depending on the census year and everything. We have a lot of people in Florence. All of those people need to be impacted by the gospel of Christ. All of those people need to experience and encounter God's love for them. All of those people, which include us, by the way, all of those people need to experience the goodness of our God. What has God given you that you could give to others, that you could share with others? What might God be calling you to participate in in order for other people to experience God's goodness? Because if we are going to practice this value of generosity for the church, and if we're going to practice this dynamic of we're going to give and we're going to expe expect God to make sure that we're thriving and that the, our, the places we're investing in is thriving also, if we're going to do that, it's going to lead somewhere. And I believe it's ultimately going to lead to more people knowing God and that in that knowledge of God, then maybe they would be inspired to make him known, just like we are inspired to make him known. Because generosity, it lives out our confession of the gospel of Christ so that more and more people, starting with us, but more and more people would give their thanks and their adoration, their worship, to God, and that they would be connected with him as we are connected with him.